Good morning, cultists. Welcome to Dessert Time with Cthulhu's. It is done. Our Basking in Glory campaign was a grand success. At least, I think so. So obviously, we need to do a post-mortem to give this a proper send-off. So if you're new to the channel or you've never seen any of my post-mortems before, basically I'll be talking about the overall campaign, what worked and what didn't work. We'll take a trip down memory lane and talk about our different characters, their accomplishments and failures, and then we will finish things off with a tour around the world. Alright, so there's no real structure to these things and it can get a little rambly, so um, bear with me. But I think we might start things off with a trip down memory lane, because I don't really know where else to start, I guess. Alright, so let's not talk about Marsha right now. Nope, we will be starting things off with Lope Muzes of Asturias, which was of course our first character and our great-grandfather as it turns out. Fantastic. So I think we started this campaign as the Count of uh, Tudela and Najera? Is that right? I think we had two counties, right? Or was it more? Um, did I also have Navarra? Hold on, let me look at this thing. Um, no, we did not start off with Navarra. Right, gotcha. Okay, was this what? Oh, he was not slain by me, as it turns out. Okay, then um, we definitely had Tudela, right? Yeah, I think we gave this away. Alright, so... I think so? Right, right, because this guy was the um, dude that we branched off from. At least our dynasty, I think. Right? House Cassit started with... Let me see. Okay, this is... Uh... <laughs> yeah, so it started with Lope, who I guess founded the dynasty? Um, no, he did not. Never mind. Uh, this looks to be a little... Never mind. Alright, so anyways, I guess the uh, dynasty didn't start off with him, but maybe... Ah, okay, so this guy. Gotcha. So we definitely started off with Najera, I think. And then we eventually... We also started with Tudela, right? I'm pretty sure. Yes, we inherited that thing, so we definitely started off with Najera and Tudela, and then eventually grew to uh, span across all this, which was quite something, I gotta say. So anyways, um, I think part of the reason, or the main reason why I picked uh, Lope as our starting character was because he was the one of the only Basque dudes around? At least uh, one of the only Basque dudes who were Muslim, as far as I'm aware. And also, he had a uh, passing resemblance to Tim Meadows, <laughs> which I thought was kind of interesting, but I guess after he aged, he kind of lost that resemblance, whatever resemblance he may have had. <laughs> what was great, though, was his starting traits and also his passing resemblance to uh, Tim Meadows. But anyways, let's not talk about Tim Meadows, um, even though he was basically the uh, <laughs> one of the reasons why we picked this character. So anyways, uh, yeah, his traits turned out to be really awesome because, well, mostly because of the sadistic thing. We've had content before, but, uh, man, sadistic is quite awesome. Being able to, um, remove your own undesirable children is something else for sure, which is why we were able to funnel all of our, um, inheritance to, uh, Audia here. <laughs> but anyways, um... Lope managed to start off as a lowly count of two counties, and then eventually become the King of Astorius, which was... Pretty, pretty impressive, I think. At least from my perspective, but uh, who knows. So, yeah, um... He did... how many wars exa exactly? Let's see, he won... 37 wars! 23 offensive and 14 defensive. Although, I think the defensive wars also count the um, peasant revolts that your vassals fight, I think? Because I'm pretty sure we won't attack 14 times. Although, um, I don't remember if we had a lot of rebellions. I don't think so, right? No. And what did you accomplish? Oh, right, those are your kills. I'm not concerned about that. But we did actually do a lot of plotting in the... Um, well, kind of throughout the campaign, actually, but uh, especially in the start, when we had to um, mobilize our dark forces to uh, 
to um, prematurely end the lives of our enemies with whom we had truces, etc, etc. Yeah. Did that end up biting us in the ass a little bit? I think someone ended up having some sort of like a blackmail thing against us, so I... Yes, kind of, but also no, because um, I actually really enjoyed that. Yeah, the intrigue parts of this game are, um, well, they're intriguing. And I appreciated that, uh, I guess, detraction, I suppose, to um, help us in our endeavor to expand quickly. But, uh, yeah. So, he accomplished a lot of things, obviously. He started out as the Count and then eventually became the King of Astorius with his glorious purple uh, coloration. Which we eventually lost, but still. Um, we also managed to convert, I think, the majority of our locations to Almohadi. So that definitely helped us out ex um, with the expansion because we got access to uh, warmongering and such. But uh, yeah, sadistic as a trait, fucking love it. abso fucking lootly love it. I would love to have the sadistic trait for every single one of my characters in the future because um, not only being able to, um, I mean, the benefit comes from not only being able to uh, plot against your own children, but also getting uh, stress relief from murdering people and shit in my dungeons, which I gotta say helped out a lot. So contrary to our previous campaign where we struggled with a lot of our stress issues, this campaign we had almost no stress issues. I think um, any, if anyone, uh, Audio was the one that struggled the most. Sorry, not Audio, but Ricardo, because Ricardo did not have the sadistic thing. Whereas everyone else was super, super fucking chill and relaxed, which um, worked out quite well for us. And also, um, yeah, I, I'm a convert. I, I'm now in camp learning. I gotta say, the whole fact that you're able to, um, oh, I guess I forgot to pick an education thing for, uh, for Marsha here. Oops, my bad. <laughs> well, I mean, the campaign's over anyway, so it doesn't really matter. But anyways, um, getting learned on the job, I think, helped us out a lot. Because that allowed us to raise our stat uh, to um, certain thresholds, which allowed us to uh, do a fair bit of stuff, which I really enjoyed. So, yeah, I think in the future, we might want to do at least a little bit of the um, scholarship stuff. Um, even if we're not actually, um, I guess, going with this uh, learning path, I guess you could say. Because um, not only learn on, on the job, but also sanctioned loopholes. I remember this actually uh, allowed us to um, claim a lot of territory uh, really quickly and all that jazz too. So, yeah, that scholar tree by itself. Oh, wow. That thing is fucking awesome. Though, it's a bit of a shame that we didn't really get to explore the other ones as much. Now, obviously, we've had a lot of experience with the uh, Marshall Tree. And I really like Bellum Justum, as well as maybe, like, the Gallant Tree, because that allows us to uh, recruit more knights and all that jazz, which increased the uh, effectiveness of our troops. But I think maybe in the future, perhaps we can also try out the Diplomacy, uh, Stewardship, and Intrigue Trees. I think in terms of overall usefulness, the Intrigue Tree might be not as useful. Um, some of them might be kind of more, I guess, situational. But uh, still, I would say that it's worth exploring. Because I didn't actually think much about the learning edu um, uh, li lifestyle stuff initially. But wow, Scholar just fucking sold me on this entire thing. And also, I guess, the whole of body. I was kind of looking forward to seeing how Know Thyself worked with um, Ricardo, but he, uh, well, we'll talk about his fate later. Sorry, I'm still on um, Lope here, aren't I? My bad. So anyways, uh, Lope managed to accomplish a fair bit and uh, became a king. Can I not move this window? Oh, I can't. That's embarrassing. All right, well, embarrassing window aside, um, he was 70 when he died. He was also the cultural head, as we were all. He was dreaded, and he was illustrious, so not quite the highest level of fame, but uh, considering where he started off, I'd say he did quite well. And uh, Paragon of Virtue, um, he had the Scholar thing, and he also finished with the Martial Lifestyle, and again, 37 Wars. Gotcha. So he ruled for 34 years, which wasn't too bad, but uh, nothing in comparison to his son, Mahdi Audia. I think we may have spoken about everything we need to with Lope, right? Yeah, yeah, we're good. Okay, so anyways, um, his son 
Audia accomplished a fuck ton. Like, holy crap. In one generation, we went from, well, being Almohadi to Mushkilist. Which I think Audia may have founded, um... When exactly? I remember he started his rule out fairly early. Uh, right? Wait. So, Audia... I guess I'll just talk about this first. So, he was born, um... April 15th, 876, uh, and died April 4th, 961, at 84 years of age. All thanks to her Herculean trait, which was quite useful. But, um, I guess maybe not as useful as genius, but... I don't think very I don't think few traits are as useful as genius, so yeah, a bit of a hard comparison to make. Anyways, he, um he founded the Mushkilis Faith, which was pretty fucking incredible. And then um he also became a living legend as well as the religious icon, so the highest tiers of those uh, respective uh, resources. And then we finished off with the learning uh, lifestyle trait, um, strategist and scholar, if you can believe that. So, quite the accomplishment there, Audia. Two, uh, two skill trees uh, maxed out. Very nice. And apparently fought 113 wars. I don't remember 113 wars. I don't even remember 47 wars. But I'm assuming this also counts the vassal wars that have happened, right? Um, we haven't had too many vassals reaching outside of our realm, but, uh, we have had a few, so maybe that's why? And I think it's also the, um, various minor peasant revolts that have happened. Which I actually kind of enjoy, because, I mean, I don't like dealing with them, obviously, but it was actually kind of interesting watching the, um, different realms around us, uh, struggle with the uh, peasant revolts and then eventually give way to installing, um, former peasant leaders and uh, kings and all that jazz, but we'll talk about that when we do the tour around the world. Because I think a lot of them are still founded off the peasant rebellions, I think, at least. So anyways, with uh, besides the many wars, Audia ruled for 60 years. 60 years! Wow! That is something else. Yeah, I think, um... I mean, it's not to imply that Audia lived for too long, but, uh... Yeah, he lived for quite a while, and he also- wait, did he start the whole Witch Coven thing? I thought that was Ricardo. Wow. Um... I guess my memory of Audia is a little skewed, because... I think I'm starting to maybe blend memories of Ricardo and Audia. I mean, they look pretty practically the same, really. Well, kind of, ish. <laughs> I guess Audia is slightly shorter than his dad. Or no, Ricardo's slightly shorter than his dad, possibly. But, um... Yeah, the familial resemblance is uncanny. Oh, nope, sorry. Holy crap. That's awesome. I like that in CK3, not gonna lie. The uh, genetics um, at play are definitely a lot more, I guess, visible, you could say. Especially with some of the characters that have the uh, ugly trait and all that jazz, but... Anyways. Um, so Audia, the Avenger, was the one who actually avenged the Battle of Tour. So, he essentially... Well, I think with Audia, we essentially, um... Hit many of our goals, didn't we? Because we started out with the express purpose of basically just founding the uh, Empire of Iberia. And then also, um, avenging the Battle of Tour. So, maybe not the express purpose, but, um, two express purposes? Sure, and because of how easily we accomplished this, at least from my perspective, um, I decided to expand our goals and uh, do a bit more and also play play the, um, I guess, Dynasty game by, well, making a lot of babies and also installing a lot of people into um, various zones around the, in our neighbor's, um, you know, territories and all that jazz. Which I stayed away from doing in uh, CK2, but... Um, yeah, it wasn't... I don't... Now, obviously, you're free to uh, disagree with me on this. Um, and if you do disagree, that's totally fine. I respect that uh, people have different opinions on this. But I never really saw the point in expanding my dynasty in CK2. Um, obviously, there's the benefit of having more people to potentially cushion the fall in case there's uh, succession issues or... Maybe you don't have enough people of your dynasty to not 
have a game over. I don't know if that's the right way to phrase it, but um, yeah, suffice it to say, I was never a fan of uh, building up my dynasty in um, TK2 because it came with a lot of issues, like people being title claimants and being all jealous and wanting to um, have their uh, claims pressed and all that jazz. But in CK3, at least, you get the renowned stuff. So yeah, I got to say, I think uh, maybe growing up my dynasty might be something that I might enjoy in um, future campaigns as well. But uh, let's actually briefly talk about our dynasty, which, wow, started off with uh, very few people and now it has 219 and six houses. That is too many houses, all right? We don't need six houses. Wow. Okay, a house of three people? That's barely a house. Why would you do that? Matriarch Ava of the Kasid Sarbrukin clan. What? Um, what do you even rule? Clan of West Francia. Ah, uh, I see. Interesting that they're being called the clan though. Um, is it because of the culture? I'm assuming it's because of the culture. Malik, uh, Malika, both Basque, 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 Castilian, but still of the Iberian group. Yeah, I'm assuming she's changed her title because she's French and not, um, not, uh, Basque. Right, right, okay. So I guess she's our only, oh no, we, s oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, so that's why they're being known as the, um, as uh, matriarchs. Interesting. So I wonder if Mari is in fact uh, akin to that, like matriarch or um, patriarch or whatever. I always thought it was like the uh, religious title or whatever because we were the caliphs and all that jazz, right? But maybe not? Yeah, I noticed that we didn't have a single person named uh, Caliph something. I mean, of the Mushkilis Caliphate, sure, but uh, not Caliph something as it's usually um, is with the at least Abbasids, I think, at least. I don't know. I could be wrong. Anyways, um, where was I? Yeah, like I said, there's no structure to these things, which maybe there should be. So anyways, I think we were still on uh, Audia, the Avenger, um, who managed to avenge the Battle of Tours, found the Mushkilist uh, um, religion, which is still problematic, of course. And also... Wait, he was a bastard. Right, 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 because um, Lope didn't start out with a wife who had the uh, Herculean trait. I wonder why we decided to go with the Herculean trait and not something else. I'm assuming it was due to the convenience of this lady being around us, maybe? Maybe. But um, not bad, though, because I think that allowed us to uh, live a lot longer than, uh, than we normally would have. Which, of course, is a bit of a, a double-edged sword, because... Um, you know, you get to live longer, you get to uh, build up your resources more, and then you uh, use them more and all that jazz. But also, it means that if you don't time things properly with your succession and all that jazz, that um, you might end up with a uh, ruler who starts off his career, his or her career, fairly younger or fairly older. Which, again, comes with its own problems. Which was kind of the, um, well, kind of the issue with Ricardo, I suppose, because he started ruling when he was, what? 41 years of age, 41 years old, that's too old to be starting a uh, rule. Marcia started when she was, how old? Um, fairly young, I think maybe two years ago? Yeah, so like 23 or 24, some somewhere around there. Which was, well, I mean, I like to take over when they're like 16 years old, but uh, <laughs> obviously to time that would be almost impossible unless somehow you um, get them stressed out and all that jazz and then they just blow their uh, health and whatnot, which I guess I could have actually tried. I mean, I suppose the other option would be to uh, commit suicide, but that comes with its own problems unless you have the um, the religious tenet that uh, allows you to, allows you, to um, you know, uh, do the pious thing by committing suicide at an older age. I don't know if that makes any sense. And speaking of tenets and all that stuff, um, I don't think we use the Fatwa thing as much. I mean, we've actually had this before when we played as the uh, Donny Poloists. I believe they start off with the religious law, which is basically the same thing. Um, but we got to try out asceticism. Oh, sorry. We got to try out asceticism, which I kind of liked. 
I don't like that it uh, makes um, the, what's it, reveling stuff uh, sins, but being able to uh, meditate and convert one of our uh, traits of impatient to patient, holy shit, that was awesome. That was awesome. I'm assuming it's a really low chance of that happening though, because we, I think, did um, the meditation thing like three times or so, and we got that, I mean, maybe it means that it's a 33%, but still, I mean, it's, I'm assuming it's a relatively lower um, chance of, uh, of getting that thing, which was pretty awesome. So that makes me wonder if maybe I can go from being wrathful to calm. Um, do these... I wonder if the meditation thing, I mean, we'll have to uh, play with, play around with that in the future as well to uh, really experiment. But uh, I do wonder if the meditation thing will convert all of my quote-unquote negative traits into good ones. Which, let's face it, are not always good because we've had issues with um, things like ambitious and shit and uh, other... I think content also kind of came with problems because once we wanted to do something that was more... I guess prestigious, it uh, it gave us a lot of stress, which, you know, because we're content was easily a loss, but still. She's got a really thick neck. I think she comes from the uh, lineage of really thick neck wives. Oh, nope, that's, that's our grandmother. So, who had the really thick neck? I'm pretty sure we had someone with a really thick neck, didn't we? Yeah. Was it Ricardo who had the wife or um, lover of the really thick neck? Yeah, I seem to recall. Yeah, I thought she was of that dynasty. No. Um, no. I guess maybe the thick neck uh, runs through someone else's veins then. Or wait. Oh no, never mind. Um, I don't know. Sorry, got a little uh, distracted there. So what was I talking about? I think we're still on Audia. I think we might be done talking about Audia. So yeah, um, sorry, we're not done apparently because <laughs> yeah, um, another thing that we got to uh, try out is actually getting another perk. So cons I mean, we had to basically take the um, options to lead down the path of zealousness, quote unquote, um, like basically our entire lifetime to finally get the zealous trait. But good to know that it's actually possible to get a new personality trait. Um, so that's something to keep in mind in the future. And also, becoming a witch was uh, pretty clutch, I gotta say. Really clutch, as a matter of fact. And it seems that it might be something that we got because we were taking the scholar lifestyle um, path, possibly? Yeah, anyways, that was awesome. And um, I mean, this minor di the diplomacy loss, I don't really mind. Because essentially, every time we decide to do a um, grand right and basically have an orgy with my family and friends, um, I get a new intrigue perk unlocked, which maybe not super useful, but I mean, how do you say no to a free perk, right? I mean, just don't say no to a free perk. It's like free drugs. Never say no. I mean, you should maybe sometimes say no, but um, you know, in this case, never say no to a free perk. That's what I say, but anyways. Um, I think we can finally move on from Audia to Ricardo, who, um, started ruling at the age of, uh, I think 41 we determined, right? Yes, so we played between April 4th, 1961 and, sorry, 19? 961? <laughs> 1961, yeah, a thousand years later, he finally got to rule. No, um, 961 to 970, uh, 997. Okay, so, uh, Marsha started ruling two years ago. Gotcha. And died at the age of 77. I fully expected, uh, Ricardo to live longer than his father did, but he was brutally cut down at the, well, not really prime of his age, by a rival. So, when Ricardo first died, and it turned out that he was murdered, I w I'm, I'm gonna be perfectly honest with you, I was a little miffed. I wasn't sure if that was the story that I was hoping for, for Ricardo, but thinking about it now, it makes so much sense. It makes so much sense. Because while Ricardo did not start the Musculist uh, faith, he had to deal with the uh, heretical rebellion of the Nazari dudes who, let's face it, are still kind of like around a little bit. Um, not to a great extent, mind you. As a matter of fact, they are, 
Well, they've only got two counties. Where would that be? So... Oh! Okay, so once we stomp that out, that'll be pretty much done and dusted. Even though I'm pretty sure we still have a lot of uh, Nizari dudes in our dungeons and all that stuff. So, um, under Ricardo's rule, um, we had to stomp out a massive heretical uh, uprising, as well as uh, various rebellions, and then we started the pr lengthy process of banging every beautiful woman in sight until we've had the perfect candidate, or nearest uh, perfect candidate for uh, succession, which was Marsha. So, yeah, he ended up with a lot of uh, ladies who did not appreciate his unfaithful ways. So, in other words, he made a lot of enemies. Like, if you look at the Nizari dudes in our dungeon, that's basically all Ricardo. And I think he... Wait, he... Yeah, yeah, we also did the Kingdom Invasion one with the uh, Byzantines. So, I think Ricardo basically pissed off a lot of people. And he was also the one that had to deal with the... Um, with the uh, crusade against us. So I think that actually made a lot of sense that um, it ended up being... Uh, he ended up being assassinated. Yeah, I mean, you don't see them in my dungeons necessarily. But, um, yeah, I remember there were at one point a lot of uh, Nizari people in our dungeons and all that stuff. Um, and he, again, made a lot of enemies, so I think it was actually perfect that uh, Ricardo got assassinated at the tender age of 77. But I... And also, I was kind of glad because I completely forgot that we actually needed to do something with Marsha, which was the um, the whole reason why we went down the uh, lengthy process of, um, I guess, um, creating an ubermensch in our uh, dynasty. And... Because he died uh, before the end of the campaign and we got to play as Marsha, I was able to um, do the strong-blooded thing for a dynasty and uh, see all that stuff. So, at first I was myth, but I'm really glad that, uh, that and you know, Ricardo died and all that stuff, and it was quite fitting. So, uh, what else about Ricardo? Um, besides crushing the rebellions and all that stuff, he's fought in 55 wars. 27 offensive and 28 defensive. Um, Ricardo... Oh, wait. I think I may have forgotten to uh, talk about something about uh, Audia. We can't really talk about Audia without talking about his um, daughters and how they were meant to... Um, well, they're all dead now. Wow, all of his children are dead. Damn. So, obviously, we had to off the uh, sons so that uh, Ricardo could uh, rule. But, um... I... I actually really love the fact that we had like one son uh, surviving and then the rest all, you know, the daughters, well, most of them anyways, um, ended up being queens. That was actually kind of like, it's hard to, not aesthetic, because aesthetic, I guess, kind of implies a visual component, but I like that whole theme about the, uh, you know, the uh, one brother who ends up being the emperor and then the, um, you know, sisters who rule uh, various kingdoms outside of our original intended place. I mean, I suppose it was kind of like a little sexist, I guess, but... Um, I mean, we ended up with a, a queen on the throne, which is what I wanted to do a little bit sooner, but... Um, I guess it kind of just worked out this way. I suppose I kind of expected the campaign to go a little bit longer-ish, maybe? I don't know. I honestly don't really know what to ex uh, what I expected. I just wanted to eventually play as a queen, but um, we didn't really get to do that too much. Maybe in the future campaign, we can try a campaign where we start out as a uh, female character and, you know, stay as uh, female rulers for the majority of our campaign, but who's, uh, we'll see. I don't know why I'm circling this. I'm just, like, randomly moving my mouse around, it seems. Um, so what else is there to say? Oh, right, so uh, Audia's children. Yeah, it's a shame that I felt the need to um, get my other daughters uh, married off to uh, people to forge alliances. Which ended up not really going too many places. I guess our alliance with the Oglobits was somewhat useful-ish. Um, but otherwise, yeah. I guess, if nothing else, it gives us additional renown because... Um, I remember at one point there was a... yeah. See the whole count and uh, baron by marriage. So you basically get the half the amount of our renown that you normally would. 
if they were just the um, count or baron or duke or king or emperor or whatever. But uh, still, cool that you can actually just marry into a fame and then um, gain some renown that way. And speaking of which, um, I gotta say, I feel like Studious Youth really helped us out with our um, Dynasty's education stuff. Because before we took this, the highest level of education that we saw in our Dynasty was like level 2 or possibly 3. But now we've got a lot of people who are level 4. Um, or, you know, I think most people are level 3 or higher, which is uh, quite a bit of a difference, I feel, at least. But, yeah, maybe not that much. Um, also cool that uh, we got to play around with the uh, Convergent Blood. I don't know how useful this was necessarily, but um, I feel like maybe it helped out a little bit, at least. At least maybe with our uh, daughter here, who has become the, basically, a Dynasty Ubermensch. Um... But uh, she will never get a chance to rule because, well, the campaign is over, basically. But, uh, yeah. Um, so I guess, you know, our daughters, it was pretty cool to uh, set that up. Would have been great if uh, they all survived and they all got a chance to rule. But uh, we had to, you know, because um, Ricardo was not our firstborn, we had to make sure that... And then we also changed our um, religion to basically allow uh, both genders to um, rule and all that stuff. Uh, we had to disinherit and, um, not convert these ladies back and then get them, uh, their own lands and all that stuff, but still. Um, maybe I could have timed that a little bit better, but, oh well, that's fine. I think, um, I don't know if there's anything that stands out in my memory that I feel like I really buggered up or that I should change in the future. I guess, if nothing else, maybe the fact that I do this, where I sire a whole army of people um, to pick from, maybe that's something that we can possibly look into not doing in the future, but I really like the um, eugenics thing with our family, gotta say. Like, the whole uh, breeding the perfect candidate and all that stuff, there's something about this that I really, really enjoy, and that I want to do in uh, all campaigns, but maybe it's... Uh a little gamey? I don't know. I mean, I feel like... Uh, I don't know. <laughs> it, it, it's... it. What am I trying to say here? Am I trying to say that um, to play the game effectively you have to be somewhat gamey? That's not it, because I'm pretty sure people can um, game, uh, play this game pretty well without having to uh, game the system. Um... I guess it's always been my way of circumventing the... Uh, limitations of uh, Gavelkind Succession, because that's essentially the succession type that we're locked into for... Unless you play for like a very long time, I think that's pretty much the succession type that we're locked into for the majority of our campaign. So, I mean, it used to be easier in CK2 to eventually adopt uh, different uh, succession types, but I feel like in CK3, um, with the combination of the culture uh, system and all that, uh, the technology and all that jazz, yeah, it's, um, it's a bit more difficult, so I honestly don't mind if I let myself do this, but obviously that's coming from my perspective. I don't know how it feels like as a, a viewer um, to do the whole eugenics thing and uh, pick up my favorite character, um, but yeah, I don't know. Um, I really enjoy it, but uh, I, I guess I'm not really talking about uh, this or that. I don't know. I'm like going dizzy just talking about uh, garbage here. So anyways... <laughs> um, Ricardo ended up having a lot of children. It says 32 children, but we've actually sired more than that because there were a lot of uh, children that were not acknowledged by uh, Ricardo uh, for one rare, for one reason for not or another. So I think it might actually be closer to somewhere like maybe 50 children or so, which is pretty crazy. And it seems a lot of them have founded their own Bastard Dynasty, which is pretty awesome. Um, well, I guess it kind of dilutes our um, brand name somewhat, but still. Pretty, pretty cool to see. Yeah. Very cool to see, as a matter of fact. I would love to see more of this. And you know what? I would love to see these guys uh, maybe duke it out in the future for supremacy or something. I don't know. That would be pretty awesome. Like, have a, um, you know, every you know, once in a while we'll gather around for a little... Um, summoning of Iblis and uh, a massive uh, family orgy where we just get each other pregnant and then we um, duke it out in a royal rumble where we spill out a lot of blood um, from the orgy of course and also from um, people wanting to uh, be part of our um, you know proper dynasty and all that stuff 
that would be pretty cool, but I don't know. <laughs> I'm just rambling here. <laughs> um, so what else? Uh, I guess that's pretty much what uh, Ricardo accomplished besides, you know, going from being uh, impatient to patient with that meditation thing. And we also ended up with a lot of stuff here, so I guess that's another accomplishment. Yeah, and uh, we, you know, fucked a lot of ladies and made a lot of babies. I think Ricardo ended up with how many lovers? I couldn't even count, and um, I can't believe we still cl can't click on- Okay, this is a bit of a criticism of the game, but I can't believe we could still can't click on the uh, lovers thing to expand it. Because I had more than uh, this number of lovers, and I couldn't click on this like I can with the children thing to um, see all my lovers and shit, which I gotta say infuriates me, but whatever, that's fine. We're not really here to, um, well, we're not strictly here to uh, criticize the game and all that stuff. Uh, so I guess we'll move on from Ricardo and talk about Marsha. Well, we talked about Marsha, basically. We ruled for two years and that's pretty much it. And then we also gave birth to the uh, next Ubermensch, um, Avalon, who is Genius, Herculean, and Beautimus, apparently. So, yeah. Alright, um... Well, Marsha actually ended up uh, having the exact same traits as uh, Ricardo. And, uh... It's a bit of a shame that we couldn't pass on the sadistic thing. I think that's something that I would really like to see in, um... Well, not necessarily future campaigns, because I can't really control that, but... Maybe if, um, Paradox could make it so that, um... You could try to at least instill... A certain trait into your child or whatever, like drill that into them. Maybe you can choose a certain uh, trait that you want to focus on, uh, passing down to your child or something, and then that could come with repercussions or whatever. I don't know. That would be, I think, pretty cool. But um, yeah, a bit of a shame that we didn't get a uh, chance to uh, pass that on. Um, and I guess that's about it for at least uh, what we accomplished here. Of course, Marsha, the Blood Mother. Whoa. That's a pretty cool title. I'm assuming that's because we took the strong blood trait, right? That's why we got the blood mother thing? Yeah. Also, Dynasty Many Crowns. Pretty powerful, gotta say. Increases my stewardship by two, which of course will increase my uh, domain holding limit. Um, or at least once it gets to a certain, uh, certain threshold, I suppose. Um, pretty powerful, I think. Um, but, yeah, I... Guess there's not much else to really say. We ended up with a great husband who is our half brother and also brother in law. <laughs> half brother, husband, and brother in law. Wow, analytical lackey apparently. Fantastic. Um, and with him, we made our uh, daughter, but I've already talked about that. Okay, well, I guess that's pretty much it for our trip down memory lane. Um, things that worked well. Uh, I guess building up our dynasty once we got to a certain point, though I think... I think, um, to prevent any issue through the succession, I think when you start things, start out, it might not be a bad idea to keep your dynasty small, and then eventually once you get to a certain point and you start expanding and, um, conquering uh, neighboring uh, kingdoms, etc, etc, I think that would be a good point at which you can, um, start to you know, build up your dynasty and all that stuff. And it looks like Burgundy is also, sorry, not Burgundy, but uh, Brittany is also expanding into Wales. Interesting. All right, well, good for you guys. Um, best of luck, and hopefully in the future we'll see the spread. We won't because the campaign is done, but still. All right, um, what didn't work? Uh, I guess maybe... I honestly don't really remember too many frustrations. No. Um... I guess the only issue that I might have had was the build-up of uh, offensive war malices and all that stuff once we... Um, or before we adopted uh, the warmongering tr um, tenant and also or of Almohadism. And after we uh, abandoned that thing when he became Mushkilist. I guess, um, it's a bit more impactful with, uh, clan-type, uh, vassals, because their opinion basically dictates how much, um, tax they provide you and all that stuff. So, I guess it's a bigger problem? Oh, so, one thing I noticed is the whole no alliances clan vassal thing. So, I guess the implication of that system means that as a clan, 
we should build up our dynasty as big as possible and then marry off our children to important vassals, families. I get the idea. You know, it's like the whole, like, you know, ruling family that uh, is that has ties to the other families and then they keep them in check because they've got the whole marriage stuff going on. I don't know. But I, I understand that that's the um, kind of idea behind it. I feel like that's a little detrimental to our um, goals, though, because of the whole succession issue and Gavilkind being absolute ass if you have uh, many people um, in line to succeed. So, as much as I like the idea, I think maybe um, if we want to do that, then we have to basically wait for a, a better succession uh, type. And I think I also forgot to past absolute crown authority you know what i'll do this now um just to kind of see i guess fantastic and we can now designate an heir oh that costs a thousand prestige um if i don't is there an issue i'm assuming not right yeah i'm assuming not but i'm guessing now my direct vassals hate me more yeah okay um but I guess, maybe, I don't know, I mean, I think the whole building up your dynasty and uh, marrying your children off to uh, various uh, vassals and all that stuff. Something that used to be much more viable in CK2 because um, the, I think Muslim religion uh, was somewhat considered to be overpowered due to the uh, instant access to the open succession law, which was widely considered to be one of the best types of succession laws out there. It's basically a meritocracy. You can just unland, um, make sure that all of your children are unlanded, except for the one that you want to inherit, and then just give that person land um, before you think you're going to die, and then boom, Bob's your monkey's uncle. Um, no succession issues, no issues of uh, fracturing the realm, um, just bypass every bullshit, and then pass go, I guess you could say. So, if that system were still in place here, then yes, I definitely would have uh, done that by, or leaned into that by, you know, siring a lot of children and then marrying them off to the different uh, clans and um, forming those alliances and all that stuff. That would have been amazing. That would have been fucking great. But everyone starts out with Gavelkind in um, CK3. So I think maybe that's a little less viable. I don't know. Um, I don't like that everyone starts off with Gavelkind. I get that the open succession law was somewhat overpowered. Um, to a certain extent though. Because once you uh, get to a point where you can do like ultimate geniture or I guess to a lesser extent primogeniture succession and all that stuff. Um, it's kind of a moot point. At least, you know, that's how it was in CK2. I would always do the uh, Ultima Geniture Succession and then just bang those um, various ladies. Basically do what I'm doing now, but with, like, less steps, I guess you could say. Because you didn't necessarily need to um, off your children. You can just, you know, stop uh, banging those ladies and then stop getting them pregnant. So that uh, the last child that you had was your genius, strong, you know, attractive child or whatever, I guess you could say. But, um, yeah... I don't know if it's supposed to be different um, with CK3, but I don't know. Um, I guess one thing that kind of did help was being Basque and having access to the, uh, the technology of ours. The Visigothic codes, which allowed us to do high partition. Still partition, though. So, yeah. Um, also cool that we could do equal right off the bat, but... Uh, what I noticed was how the Visigothic culture didn't have the uh, Visigothic um, code, which was really strange. Yeah. It's like, I don't know how to uh, describe it. It's just bizarre that the Visigothics didn't have the uh, access to Visigothic codes. But anyways, that's that's something completely different. Um, What else did I mean to say? Oh, so um, the whole... I guess building tall for our uh, culture and uh, technology worked out really well because it seems like we have one of the most advanced um, cultures in the world right now. Yeah, because even compared to the Mashkiri, we still have more technologies unlocked, including as well as the Bedouin. Um, the Greeks, I think... Nope, we're still ahead of the Greeks. 
We're ahead of the Occitans. We're ahead of the French. Yeah, I think our culture is basically one of the most advanced ones in the world right now. At least in terms of our technologies unlocked. I guess some of them are somewhat similar. In terms of the overall numbers, I suppose we're pretty much the same here. But I like to think that we, you know, are a little ahead because we have more early medieval stuff, stuff unlocked than the Persians, but eh, whatever. So yeah, the whole building tall thing and only um, converting our cultures in places where the uh, development was high, I think uh, worked out really well this time. I still don't like that system. I still think that system is kind of stupid because, I mean, then it stops me from wanting to spread my culture. But why would I want to do that unless I wanted to gain the system, which is exactly what this system kind of encourages. So instead of doing that, instead of having the average development of Basque countries, why not just have the uh, size of the country or the uh, culture adding to that a little bit? So on top of this or whatever, you can add something else so that um, maybe it encourages people to uh, build up their or spread their cultures more? Doesn't that make more sense? Rather than um, this system where you just, you know, if you have like development 50 million here, just have that be the only place with their culture and then, I don't know, I just don't really uh, like the system, so... Yeah, I mean, I'm getting more used to the culture stuff, like the uh, technology and the innovations. It still doesn't really make any sense, because imagine in this scenario, like for example, if the Andalusians have access to uh, uh, crop rotations, uh, but we don't, like we... The Andalusians live in our cult... Uh, the, the, the culture exists in our realm. So, are you telling me but that because I'm Basque, but my neighbor who's living next to me is Andalusian, um, I see him, like, for example, well, okay, let's use, like, maybe not crop rotation, maybe, let, let's use, like, toilets as a fucking example, right? So, imagine if I'm Basque, and we haven't discovered toilets yet, and, um, our Andalusian neighbors have. So, here I am, a, uh, Basque lord or noble or whatever, I'm just enjoying life, uh, taking a dump in the middle of my house because we don't have toilets and then I go over to my Andalusian neighbor's house We see that he's got a toilet. Oh great. Here's a man with an idea uh, Let's adopt this toilet technology and use it for ourselves No, apparently that doesn't work because we're of different cultures. So I look at your toilet and go What the fuck is this thing? What a fucking barbarian. He's shitting in this place in this dedicated shit spot that doesn't stink that doesn't spread disease, that doesn't have all these problems, and isn't on top of my child's face. How? What? That is crazy. No, I'm not doing this. That's, to me, what, what what's happening here. This makes no sense. I mean, I guess we get the whole, you share a religion with the different culture and all that stuff, but that, to me, makes no sense. I don't know. It just, I don't get it, but... I don't know. I mean, it's an imperfect system, I think, and hopefully it's something that gets addressed in the future, because I don't like the whole idea of building tall and gaming the system uh, to get ahead of the uh, thing, because it just, it makes no sense. It just, I don't get it. Anyways, um, that being said, our system of gaming the system did work out well this campaign, so <laughs> I think maybe that's just something that we have to do, um in the future as well, I don't know. But, um, hopefully that's something that can change, and maybe that's something that can be fleshed out more, um, as time goes on, but who knows. That's, of course, just asking for more DLCs that we have to pay for, so... I guess there's that. Anyways, um... What else worked really well for us? Or didn't work really well for us? Uh... I don't know. I guess maybe some of the... Having to create title stuff? I feel like there were a couple of points where I felt like... Oh man, I think I... I feel like I wasted my money with that uh, title. Or another. Um... It's not really coming to me, if I'm being perfectly honest with you, so... I... Not really sure. I may have expressed it at some point, um... But, I don't remember. Um... What didn't work? I guess we had more rebellions? So maybe the fact that we were constantly at war was a, a bit of a detriment in uh, certain uh, parts of the campaign. 
But um, I've explained this before. Um, it's a little difficult for me, especially uh, to, well, not be a constant warfare because if I'm playing CQ2 or CQ2 by myself, then sure, I don't mind letting just time pass and nothing really happening. But um, as I'm producing content, I feel like I need to be at least doing something productive, which is why I feel like I'm always looking for wars and ways to end truces and all that stuff. I guess I could edit the um, episodes and then just have only the interesting parts. But if I guarantee you, if I start doing that, we will only have uh, like few episodes per week. Uh, you won't get um, one episode per day. I guarantee you that because I'll have to do a lot of editing and whatnot, which is kind of difficult for me. Um, so if we do that, then you're going to get less content. And also, I, I like to make the content, the kind of content that I like to uh, consume myself. Which is unedited and just, I maybe not so much like me, but <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but largely unedited stuff where um, there's no skips, and that way I don't lose any context about uh, what's happening and you know, what the uh, crea content creator is talking about and all that stuff. So that's how I like to do things. So I could, um, but I would not necessarily enjoy that. So I don't know. I mean, I think maybe. So, I keep talking about CK2 and I apologize for that, but uh, when Monks and Mystics came out in CK2, I felt like there was a lot less um, pressure for me to be a constant warfare because there was a lot of stuff to do in between wars, like a lot of RPG stuff, like the uh, various um, Holy Orders. Uh, was it the Holy Orders? Yeah, the Holy Orders and the uh, various Warrior Lodges always give me a lot of stuff to do. Um, but it's a little, I think, harder with uh, CK3 because... You know, those features don't exist. So maybe as time goes on, I'll feel less pressure to uh, constantly be at war. And then perhaps that'll uh, prevent us from getting the um, peasant uh, rebellions that we've uh, maybe suffered through. But it wasn't that bad, though. I mean, they're not difficult to uh, deal with. They're just a little uh, bit of an inconvenience. But um, yeah, the only issues I, I guess we had with the rebellions was, you know, when our vassals were rebelling against us. But that kind of worked out, especially with Burgundy here, who... Uh, Kind of got fucked over and then basically skipped the succession, succession over to his daughter, who was, I suppose, in line to inherit everything anyways. So, yeah, it kind of worked out there. Um, I guess that's kind of the overall overview of the campaign. I apologize if I missed anything and if I um, glazed over anything um, or if I didn't really highlight any uh, problem that I might have had. Um... Obviously, I'm always looking to uh, improve and get better and produce better content and stuff. So, yeah, I will be thinking more about uh, what I could do better in the future. But anyways, um, the uh, this, I guess, postmortem is already kind of getting long in the tooth. So let me just do a quick uh, tour on the road. I say quick, but um, this might be another 15 to 30 minutes or so. So I apologize for that. Anyways, let's do a tour on the road. So we'll be looking at our neighbors first, who are, of course, uh, all family. This guy's my cousin. He's the ruler of uh, Aquitaine, and he only has 6,000 troops. All right, I mean, not to bash you there, sir, but I feel like you could have done a little bit better, but um, cool. All right, so that's Aquitaine. Burgundy is ruled by, well, whoever was supposed to rule this, but uh, this guy kind of fucked himself over. Well, I mean, he has leprosy, so I don't know if he was really going to, um, you know, rule for that much longer, really. I guess maybe... Did he contract leprosy inside my uh, dungeon? I don't remember, but anyways. Um, so Burgundy appears to be kind of growing into uh, East Francia here. Not by a whole lot, but uh, good to see that my family is expanding. And then we have France, who um, had a lot of issues. Yeah, so it started off with this lady who has um, such a thick neck that it has lifted off her body and is approaching the stratosphere. Wow, what the fuck? Died under mysterious circumstances. Could the mysterious circumstance be that the um, her neck has left her own body? Like, it's turned into a fucking airplane. It's like so far off her body. It's like in the sky. Anyways, um, <laughs> neck issues aside, I guess um, the siblings here had a bit of a disagreement in terms of uh, who should be ruling, and he was murdered. 
Right, which is why Goroslava came back to me. And which is why we no longer have an alliance with uh, France. I can offer to join your war? Oh, I see. People are rebelling against you. I see. All right, well, uh, good luck to you, and hopefully um, you'll get your shit together, but um, not sure that's going to happen. And then we have the uh, Brittany here with their really thick necks. Obviously, uh, the Britons are uh, known uh, throughout the world for their incredibly thick necks. Um, but only the uh, Britons of the uh, Bretons of the uh, Basque variety, of course. Anyways, um, let's see. She is expanding into uh, Wales, which is pretty fantastic. So um, maybe if we let these guys do their stuff, um, perhaps France and um, Brittany will come to blows. And it seems like France is kind of weak right now. Will eventually come to blows and then uh, vie for um, conquest over the British Isles, but who knows. And then south of us, we have the former Kingdom of Marrakesh, which has exploded in a fiery ball visible from space. Like, what the fuck? What the fuck happened here? Like, why are you so bad at this? My god. Damn, girl. This sucks. What happened here? Oh. Good grief. Well, thankfully, she's still the queen, but, um... Wow, really? You're ruling out of Canarius? Good grief. Oh man, my beautiful kingdom. Oh, well. It's fine. We got what we wanted, which was, you know, the uh, Ten Thrones achievement, or I guess it's known as... What's it known as? Um, I forget. Oh, what's, uh, what is nepotism, I think. Anyways, um, Marrakesh has exploded into 50 million uh, chunks. Um, hopefully they can get their shit together, but doubtful. And then we have, uh, well, these guys. Who were, right, the Kingdom of Tahirt. And then became this. Um, so, more issues down here too. Yeah, but I guess that's not really a huge deal. And I guess whatever goodwill we had with the Aglabids is... Well, I don't know if there's much left, really. No. Yeah, it would be really cool, again, to um, see um, rival dynasties and all that stuff. Because I feel like, uh, in addition to the Aglabids, we also had a lot of uh, dynasties that we uh, fought against. Um, or had minor tussles with? Or constant tussles with? Like, if you recall the Kaysids. Oh, there's two living members! Oh, they're both going to die. Oh, no. Oh, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. The Kaysid dynasty is done and dusted. Holy shit. That is fantastic. What other dynasty did we compete with? Definitely the Umayyads, didn't we? Yes. Okay, so let me see about the Umayyads. Oh, five people left in the Umayyad dynasty. Six living members. Wow, wow, wee wow. And the head of the Umayyad uh, um, house is of our, of our religion. Wow. Fantastic! And they're mostly all uh, Saidi still. Holy crap, holy. Alright, well, um, not quite stomped out, but uh, cool. I think the... Uh, to be fair, though, the bloody, uh, blood of the Umayyad still kind of courses through our veins because I'm pretty sure we have um, people of our dynasty with the... Um, with the Saeed trait. Which doesn't, of course, imply that they are mush... or they are descended from the... Uh, Umayyads, that just just means that they're patrilineally descended from, um, from, uh, Al, uh, from, yeah, from, sorry, Muhammad, the prophet. Um, so, but we got this actually from the, uh, Umayyads, so, yeah, the, uh, blood definitely flows through our veins. The Hakamid, to be exact, who are of the, who are a uh, branch of the, of the, uh, Umayyads. Do they still exist, the Hakamids? Oh, they still do exist. Okay, so there's only one left, but, um, still. Good to see that these guys are still around, I guess. Yeah, wow. Fantastic. <laughs> Almost dead, but um, I suppose you could say that the blood of the Umayyad still um, exists in, uh, in a small way, but still. Okay, so I think that's pretty much all the um, Kassid... Uh, oh, wait, no. We also have Sardinia and the um, uh, regions in Italia. All right, uh, Sardinia is, well, Sardinia, I don't know if they'll really uh, grow to be that much more than that. Um, if anything, they might get swallowed up by Ital uh, the uh, dudes in Italy, but um, yeah, I also kind of doubt that. Well, 
actually... I think as long as they kind of get um, preoccupied by the uh, various um, issues from within, maybe they won't be able to uh, lift a finger to uh, dick each other around? Possibly? I mean, as long as they, I guess, stay um, as allies, maybe they'll be alright, but who knows. And I guess we could have also granted independence to these two, but... Actually, you know what? Maybe it's not such a bad idea to uh, have some presence here. That way, if we uh, choose to expand in these areas, then we can um, always, you know, do that. Because they're so much closer. Okay, so, um, that was Sardinia, Italy, and Romagna. Um, Sicily. Yeah. Like seeing the uh, Cassid dynasty there. Uh, it's only... It's like rose-colored now, the borders. I noticed that the Umayyads have the silver one, which I guess um, means that they're lower. Significant is higher than well-known, which is what we are. I see. Okay, so the Carling still kind of beat us there, but whatever, that's fine. I won't cry, cry over the uh, cry over that. Maybe just a little bit. All right. So, anyways, um, I don't know if there's much to say about these guys, so I'll just move on, I guess. Um, looking at uh. Well, I'm not going to look at the individual realms here, but uh, the Carling still exist in Bavaria. I thought Bavaria at some point was taken over by... Peasants, no? Installed by faction demand, but uh, he was also a Carling. And Clement, I'm pretty sure, is... Yes, another Carling. Gotcha. Alright, so I guess Bavaria's always been ruled by Carlings then. Um, unless maybe something changed? What? Dynasty is this. That sounds somewhat Irish or Welsh? Hold on. Oh, okay, so I don't know if they're Irish or Welsh. Um I mean this guy is Gaelic, so I guess um possibly Irish or maybe Scottish, I suppose. Ish? I don't know. They're ish. They're um Scottish or Irish or some sort of ish, I guess, which pretty much is everything, but still. Um, was it East France, yeah, that had the peasant dynasty? Schauenberg, I think? Is that right? Um... No? Oh, yep, yep, definitely. The Schauenberg, uh, definitely a peasant, uh, dynasty. Which I thought was really fucking cool. Like, the fact that the uh, these royalty uh, dudes descended from um, peasants who got upset about their uh, lieges and then started a, a revolt. Really cool. Um, hopefully something that we can see uh, more in the future, too. Um, what? Right, that's East Francia. Yeah. Um, and I think there was a few more dynasties out there that, um, that start started out from uh, peasants, but uh, I don't really feel like digging through that to uh, find out. So anyways, the Catholic faith. Um, wow. Zero fervor. Holy shit. And of course, the papacy doesn't exist. No longer has the ecumenism thing. Which means that they are no longer considered to be, I think. Yeah. Alright, so they can actually be considered hostile by uh, other other um... Christian faiths, I think, that means. Holy crap, holy, that is awesome. That is really awesome. Alright, um... Yeah, I think Catholicism is... I mean, as long as, uh, this, I guess, you know, this, uh, track goes through, if that makes any sense. This trend goes, uh, keep, continues in this, um, I guess, world. Uh, yeah, Catholicism will most likely give way to maybe Orthodoxy or even Insular. But, uh, with my family members expanding into the British Isles, I think that's also, um, kind of has its, uh, days numbered, if you could say that. Um, but, uh, what else? I guess, yeah, not much in, uh, I guess Central Europe? Sure. Uh, culture map mode in Central Europe, in case you're curious. And, um, Italy. I haven't noticed a lot of, uh, um, I guess culture changes. If anything, maybe a couple more uh, counties changed to Basque, but the entire time that Aquitaine was ruled by a Basque person, I don't think a single county changed to uh, being Basque, not even the capital, which is kind of strange. But, uh, yeah. I guess that's just how it works, maybe? I don't know. 
I don't know what motivates the characters to uh, convert their cultures. I'm assuming uh, if a character is zealous or has tendencies towards uh, zealousness, they try to uh, proselytize in their realm or county or their territories. But I don't know if that's there's anything to do with that and uh, culture. But anyways, um, so that's uh, Central Europe, and we go to the British Isles which are largely insular with uh, our mushkulist uh, faith coming in from the south and Catholicism is... Well, I mean, I guess if the Scots remain, the Scots and the Irish remain um, Catholic, perhaps it might have a bit of a foothold, but uh, a lot of the Anglo-Saxons are um, are Catholic, so or insular rather, so... Hmm, this would be interesting. Now, insular has a much higher... Um, fervor than uh, Catholicism, so I don't know. They, maybe they'll uh, convert to this. It would be interesting to see how this um, plays out in the uh, long run, but anyways. Um, so cultural map mode in the British Isles, in case you're curious. I still see some Norse here and there, but I don't see any of the Nordic religion. What the fuck, Muwaladi is here? What in the seven million butts? When the fuck did this happen? Wait. What the... Hell, wait. The Marwan it... Okay. So, the... This dynasty, I believe we are related to. As far as I'm aware, I think. Or something. So... She conquered it. Um... Right. And then it got passed down to him. Oh, right, right, because it wasn't a... Oh, I see, so she married him, um, not matrilineally, so they had a child of the uh, different dynasty, and then he ended up taking over, and then she inherited, and then this guy did? Wait, how did it go from you to him? Are you related in some way, maybe? I guess perhaps a distant relation? Or something, but... Wow, it's been Muwaladi for a little while, I guess. Interesting. Alright, cool. Um, I guess thank you for the distraction, but otherwise... Not that interesting, I suppose. Iceland, Iceland here is still uh, Germanic and uh, Norse, of course. And then we come to uh, the uh, region of Scandinavia, which is now mostly Sweden. Wow, fantastic. Look at them. Holy shit! Wow, 28,000 angry sweaty dudes! That is insane! Damn! I don't think we ever uh, got to got close to that, did we? Maybe? Holy shit, so compared to the Mong- Wow! Holy shit, Sweden can take on Mongolia if they wanted to. Damn! Vikings versus uh, the Mongol Horde. Damn! I would pay to watch that. Sadly, the Khazarian horde, um, maybe not so, uh, not so strong, but still. How the fuck did this happen? I mean, granted, it's mostly levy, so they could probably get crushed. Because I'm assuming the horse arches are infinitely stronger than the, uh, levies, but who knows. So anyways, um, Sweden appears to be the major superpower in the, um, in Scandinavia, so interesting. And of course, it's of the prestigious Afmunza dynasty. Uh, where I believe we should eventually see Ragnar Lothbrok, Mr. Old Leatherpants himself. There we go, Ragnar Lothbrok, Mr. Leatherpants, who um, was executed by this guy. Wow, things did not end well for him. But uh, anyways. Okay, so um, I guess Sweden swallowed up uh, the vast majority of that, which is interesting to see, I suppose. Um, but still, some pretty heavy Sumanusko um, presence uh, in, I guess, Finland and, uh, you know, east of Finland, I suppose you could say. And then we have White Rus here with the Germanic um, religion, as well as Gartheriki, who I guess are maybe in competition to uh, form Russia? Possibly? The Russian culture also exists. Right, and from this guy. Of Poland! Poland is Russian. 
Interesting. All right, well, um, cool, I guess? I don't know. But uh, they do appear to be somewhat consolidating, so maybe given enough time, they'll actually form a, well, proper Poland here. But uh, who knows? Who knows? Whoa, what's that? Southern Baltic Empire. Interesting. That's got to be new. That's got to be the former Wendish Empire, right? At least in the CK2? Yeah, interesting. All right, um, so I guess we've also looked at uh, White Rus and Garth Ricky. Um, religion map mode in this area, and cultural map mode in case you're curious. Okay, cool. So moving down south, Hungary is still Altoshtist or whatever. Cool. Enjoy. Um, good to see that you haven't been stomped out of existence. Yeah, and you have no holy sites. So wait. I guess we still were the only... Oh wait, no, we're not pagan. Never mind. I uh, thought that we were pagan. But no, we're not. Um, I was going to say that we were the only reformed uh, pagan religion, but we're not pagan, so that doesn't count. Any um, pagan religion reform at all? I guess not, right? That's a bit of a shame. Because normally, I mean... Maybe I haven't played this enough to know uh, what the pagan religion would normally um, reform. I don't know. Anyways. Um, so moving to the Byzantine Empire, who I guess are not really all that interesting. Um, I don't know. They're just still Byzantine. They haven't really expanded too much. They've been somewhat, I guess, docile. Although I think maybe they swallowed up Bulgaria. I think it used to be bigger, but I don't know. Anyways. Um, and the religion map mode in this area and cultural map mode. And then we have Khazaria, who are fairly big, but not necessarily very powerful, I don't think, unfortunately. Good to see that they still remain the Jewish, though, but um, otherwise, I mean, besides the fact that they're now um, encroaching into Asia Minor and the, I guess, Near East or whatever, um, nothing new or interesting? Sure. And then the Isid dynasty still rules over the uh, Arabian Empire, despite um, them not being the Abbasids. So, do the Abbasids still exist then? I'm assuming they must, right? 45 living Abbasid members. Nope, 110. But 45 of the, uh, the just Abbasids. Gotcha. And they're famous. So, that would be... Okay, fourth from the uh, top. Interesting. All right, so still a fairly um, heavy presence, and the Caliph is just a mere vassal, unfortunately. So not quite the um, same power that they used to have, but the Abbasids are still around, and um, I mean, they have uh, maybe not as much as the uh, ruling dynasty, but still good for you guys. Yeah, it's interesting to see the Abbasids get ousted, because they usually, if they do, they usually come back, but... Um, I don't know, maybe things are different in CK3, but anyways. Um, so, religion map mode and Curious Curious and culture. I guess they're sharing between the Mashariki and the Bedouin. Cool. And then we have, um, what's it? East Africa and I suppose North Africa. Uh, Egypt ruled by these guys. So, I guess whoever ruled the, the Tulanids. They still exist. Not a whole lot of them, though. So who was the one that was married to my um, aunt or whoever? I think it was. Yeah, I see. OK, so she was married to this guy. Right, right. Who was the former ruler of the Egypt, but then got ousted, unfortunately. So he really fucked that up uh, pretty hard, got to say. Anyways, um. And then we have East Africa here, who, I guess they're still competing. I thought someone would eventually come out on top, but um, still seems like they're, yeah, just duking it out. Gotcha. With no real clear winner. I'm actually really surprised that the Kushites still exist. Because um, that's like a really minor, minor religion. At least I think when it starts out, it's a really minor religion. Um... The fact that they haven't been swallowed up is very, very interesting, I think. But I don't know. Maybe it's not that interesting. 
So uh, cultural map mode, religion map mode, and now we go into uh, Africa proper with Ghana here. Seemingly, I guess, the biggest uh, realm in Africa right now. Wow. Okay, not bad, not bad. Um, it used to be, I guess, Mali, right? Which doesn't exist anymore? What the fuck? Oh, maybe it never existed? I seem to recall there being some uh, kingdoms here, which were really, really big, and then um, quite imposing, but I guess, no, maybe they've all kind of broken down to, um, to rebellions and all that stuff. Yeah, I guess so, because we didn't really uh, do much here besides attack maybe uh, one or two realms for little pl uh, pieces of uh, counties, but yeah, that's about it. So, religion map mode. It seems like the Bidaic religion is the uh, largest one in uh, West Africa. With uh, Bori being more in uh, Central Africa, I suppose. Yeah. Oh, so... Wait, can Ghana actually reform the religion? I think almost, right? Yeah, they just might need to uh, take a couple more counties, but... Uh, if they really wanted to, they probably could. Alright, well, good for them. Um, and then we have India here. I guess the... Whoa! Pratihara is expanding into uh, Arabia. Holy shit. I have never seen that before. Well, good for you guys. Um, kudos, I suppose, for the enthusiasm and uh, optimism. But you might get there, got your uh, buttholes hoopsiously thrangled by the... Uh, well, not Abbasid, so watch out for that, I suppose. Um, besides that, though, any... Similar dynasties? Nope. I guess they're all of different dynasties. Gotcha. Hmm. Yeah, I guess India is also another place that's... That stays somewhat relatively fractured, right? Because a lot of them are pretty powerful and they always uh, duke it out with each other. And then there's no um, real consolidating of uh, realms and all that stuff. Which is a bit of a shame, but um, still. I think the closest I've ever seen... I don't know. I mean, I, I, I keep talking about the CK2 times, but so let's not. Um, would be cool to see them get more organized, though. And then eventually, I don't know. Um, yeah, I feel like maybe we haven't seen as much blobbing this time around. Hmm. I don't know. I guess it's a bit of a mixed bag. There are certain areas where blobbing was uh, pretty good and then certain areas where it wasn't. So, I don't know. Mixed bag, I guess. All right, well, in any case, uh, India is largely Sri Kuli, uh, Kula, I guess, which is a sect of Hinduism. And then there's still the Jain, which I'm surprised is still around because um, they tend to be more pacifistic. So I don't know. I guess maybe they just never really got attacked or something. Because normally the Hindu religions uh, tend to um, be more much more dominant, I suppose you could say. I guess they kind of are, but, you know. I noticed there's a big lack of Buddhism in India this time around, though. Yeah, it's mostly Hindu and a bit of Jain, but um, very few uh, Buddhist religions, as far as I can tell. Interesting. Well, seemingly so, anyways. I mean, there's some of the uh, Nangchos and um, these guys down here. Uh, Mahayana. Um, and I guess the Theravada, too. So, maybe I don't know what I'm talking about, but um, definitely not as uh, populous as the uh, Hindu um, or even the Jain religions. At least, I don't think so. And then we have our old stomping grounds of Tibet. Um, still very, very fractured. I guess maybe they never really uh, fully got around to getting their shit together. At least none of the individual um, realms did, unfortunately. Would have been really nice to see uh, Tibet get uh, formed up again, but oh well. Such is life, I suppose. Are they of uh, different dynasties, though? Because there is usually, like, the one really big dynasty that um, founded a lot of the other ones, I guess you could say. Was it the Garib? No, that seems somewhat new. Um, I'm pretty sure it was the Sumpa dynasty that, uh, that had the dude who was the former emperor of Tibet, I think. Is that right? Um, I don't think that's him. Was it him? I don't know. I, I seem to recall there being... That, used, that kind of shit used to be a lot easier to see. Oh, I guess we can also do this. Yes, so... Oh, no, it's the Pugil dynasty. Never mind. Sorry. 
So what do you guys own now? Mario? Is that it? No. What? You're the house head, but you have no military. Oh, they don't rule anything. I see. How the mighty have fallen. Interesting. Oh, so what happened to the kingdom of Mariel? Ah, conquered by a claimant. I see. Interesting. And they're also Hindu. Oh. Okay, so I'm assuming she used a kingdom invasion CB or something to uh, claim this place. Because it seems like she's got all of Mariel. Wow. Hot damn. Alright, well, I guess maybe that's a reason why maybe Tibet um, is still kind of more fractured? I don't know. I don't know where Mongolia came into existence here, but holy crap, holy. Alright, so it started a hundred years ago. I see. By these dudes, by the Kyrgyz. So, it went from the Kyrgyz cognate to Mongolia at some point. At what point does it transition from the Kyrgyz Khanate to Mongolia? Because same religion, same culture, I guess maybe they take some decision to um, become the uh, face of Mongolia or something? I don't know if that makes any sense. Because I feel like it also changed the uh, name of the title, but who knows. I don't think I've uh, monitored that uh, carefully enough to be able to say exactly what happened, but... Uh, yeah, um, sorry, religion map mode in uh, Tibet, and cultural map mode, still pretty much the same, I guess, for the most part, and now in uh, Mongolia. So the Mongol culture does exist, I see, but the realm of Mongolia is still largely Kyrgyz, whereas Mongol is part of the Mongolic group, and these guys are part of the Turkic group. Interesting, I see. Okay. Well, anyways, um, they're largely Tengri, of course. And then we have this area here. Um, I guess, what is this, like south of Siberia, I suppose? Or maybe the Siberian um, steppes, if that or is it Siberia more to the uh, east? I don't know. Um, I just think of Siberia as like, you know, vast land of snow and freezing to death and um, all that stuff. So, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> anyways, um... I guess it's still largely Sumanusko, sure, and um, of various cultures. I don't know if there's anything too, too crazy or unique going on here. Not to imply that uh, things aren't interesting, but still. Nothing too crazy except for this guy's eyebrows, and wow! I do not even know what's happening with his face, but um, apparently he's a stupid, delicate child of a concubine? Um, who... Seems to be struggling with stewardship, so maybe that's why his uh, eyebrows are constantly furrowed. Sure, fair enough. Um, I think I may have now looked at everything, and I apologize for the uh, rambling nonsense that was the tour around the world, but, um, you know, I don't really know what to expect with various stuff, and it's kind of hard to um, pick and choose what looks interesting without actually having to uh, go through everything, and obviously you can't because, well... Essentially, by the time I'm done, my um, my actual heir that I don't have yet will have to uh, take over and then eventually um, I tell you what's uh, going down, but uh, yeah. Alright, well, I think that's going to be it for our post-mortem. I apologize for the uh, rambling nonsense and the fact that it's an hour and a half uh, long. Oh my god, again. I promised to uh, try to make the uh, subsequent uh, post-mortem shorter, but no. It's just fucking unstoppable. It's a beast. <laughs> Son of a bitch. A beast that needs to be tamed for sure, but... Uh, <laughs> I think maybe it's just something that'll get better with time, hopefully? But uh, we'll see. Alright, so as I said, I'm still not entirely sure what our next campaign's gonna be. Um, I will include an option, I think, probably. Uh, no guarantees, but I may include an option to, um, to play as a Catholic ruler for our next one, so... Maybe, maybe we'll do that. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see where the uh, votes go and all that stuff. But, um, yeah. Um, I feel like I had some stuff to say about that, but I have forgotten now. So I think maybe we'll just move on. Yes. 
Yes. So, um, again, if you want me to play something really powerful like the Byzantine Empire, it's not gonna happen. It's like pretty much the same thing as starting out as the Abbasids. It's just, there's no challenge in it. I mean, I f the greatest enjoyment that I have personally in CK3, or, you know, the Crusader Kings, is um, starting out as a, one of the greatest joys is just starting out as a lowly count and then eventually becoming the ruler of the known world. Whereas if you start out as the ruler of an empire already, then, I mean, where's the challenge? You have all the resources and uh, stuff ne necessary to just pick your way through um, smaller targets and then eventually grow blobbier and then, I don't know. I guess that's a bigger challenge with the uh, starting out as a count and all that stuff, but yeah. Um. So, I guess that's it. Yes. Yes, I guess that's it. I don't know if I've forgotten anything. Um, don't know if I've forgotten to do anything either. But I think we're good to go. We have... Oh! So one thing that I maybe should have uh, tried out more in this campaign, and something that I would like to try out more in the future campaigns, is um, not just constructing holdings, but also the buildings and such. Like, I know we played around with this a little bit, like we upgraded some stuff, but... I guess also the fact that... I don't know. None of these buildings really interested me. It was only the uh, duchy buildings that I thought was interesting. But to do these things, we need a lot of uh, technology stuff, so... Yeah, that wasn't gonna get done anytime soon. But um, these things, I don't know. I mean, they're not... They don't seem to be that incredibly powerful. I mean, maybe later on in the um, farther levels, but, you know, that's gonna take a little while to get there. Uh, I'm pretty sure we need like better technology and all that stuff too, so I don't know how uh, long that would have taken, but yeah. Alright, well, um, I guess that's gonna be it. I apologize again for the uh, rambly nonsense, but uh, I guess that's just how my brain works. It's just full of rambling nonsense. Um, but hopefully you enjoyed it? Yeah. Um, that's going to be it for our Basking Glory campaign. As I said, uh, I would appreciate it if you um, could uh, give you, me some patience or be, be patient and, um, you know, let me think of what we can do for our next campaign. I'll try to make it as entertaining as possible, obviously. Um, and I'll present a few options for people to vote on and all that stuff, so... Yeah. That's gonna be it for our Basking Glory campaign. I think this rambly nonsense will um, put a nice little rambly bow on it. And um, we can call this a done campaign. Which I really, really, really enjoyed. I guess I didn't really know what to expect. I didn't think that the uh, clan uh, would be that different from uh, playing as um, feudal, which I feel like it's not. I mean, I guess maybe there are the feudal obligation stuff that we didn't really uh, get to play around with too much, but um, still. I think that's actually the... From what I understand, the feudal contract stuff is a lot more fun as a vassal than it is as a liege. So maybe that's something we can uh, possibly look into in the future. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. Um, yeah, I guess that's it. Um, again, I really enjoyed this campaign, and I hope you guys did too. Started off with us just wanting to form an empire and avenge the Battle of Tours, but it ended up uh, growing to be a lot bigger, which I think uh, was, in my opinion at least, a, a good choice, because we were kind of a unique position to, to be able to uh, do all that stuff, and uh, also see what happens when we depose the Pope and uh, also get that uh, strong blood stuff, so... I think this campaign ended up being um, a lot more than it originally was planned to be, and I like that. So maybe we'll get more of that in the future. Who knows? I guess it kind of depends on me, doesn't it? I suppose I'll have to make that decision then. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. All right. Um, well, as this is, I guess, technically the last episode of the uh, campaign, I would just like to say thank you so much for um, following with the campaign, or even if you uh, dropped in every now and then to uh, check in on the status and all that stuff. If you enjoyed the campaign, if you enjoyed the postmortem, I would greatly appreciate you uh, leaving a like. Um, if uh, I guess, let me know uh, what you guys enjoyed most about the campaign. Um, maybe what you would like to see in future campaigns. Again, um, I'm open to suggestions, just not ones where we start out as like giant empires and then, you know, um, just curb stomp everyone because that's just basically starting out, you know, easy mode, I guess you could say. Um... But yeah, uh, if you, uh, yeah, if, so I, I would greatly appreciate uh, you guys leaving comments. Um, and if you aren't already, be sure to uh, subscribe to the channel and you'll get to obviously uh, alerted, hopefully, uh, about the new content um, 
whatever that may be. Um, and if you want to support the channel financially, which you again are under no obligation whatsoever, I don't want anyone to feel pressured to do so. Um, you can do so via uh, Patreon or by joining the channel as a member via YouTube or by subscribing to me on Twitch. But again, just you guys enjoying your time here and leaving uh, nice comments is more than enough for me. So yeah, don't feel uh, pressured or obligated whatsoever. I don't want anyone to feel bad about that. So yeah. All right. Well, that's going to be it for our Basking Glory campaign. Apologies again for the uh, rambly garbage through uh, the postmortem as well as the campaign itself. Um, and hopefully you guys will enjoy whatever campaign we have next. So sorry about the lengthy uh, postmortem, but that's going to be it. So thank you so much for watching and have an amazing breakfast.